Good morning, everybody. Would you join in the call to worship printed in the bulletins? We gather as God's beloved children, however glad we are, however out of sorts we are. We have come to give thanks to pray and to sing, to be with each other. Let us worship God. And now would you join me in prayer? God, you have been our rock and our refuge, our dwelling place in all generations. We give you thanks for your sheltering care, for your nurturing and protective embrace in our lives. Above all, this morning, we thank you for the spirit and dedication of so many people in this community and for the good and positive energy coursing through this place over the past few days. Thank you, O oh God, for bringing us through it, and thank you for now letting it be over. We are a grateful and blessed community today, and we know it well as ever. May we be a people of prayer, using the words that Jesus taught to his disciples, saying together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. You may be seated. Well, good morning once again to all of you, and welcome to this service of worship and reflection on what feels like a near-perfect Sunday morning. For any visitors or guests who may be with us, if there are any, I want you to know that we are glad that you're here with us today. For those who are new to this community, we would love to get to know you just a little bit better. Just reach out to me or to Carlene, and we'd be glad to visit you in your homes or over coffee or lunch or something like that, but I'm glad that all of you gathered here are with us today. Well, it's, uh, it's been a quiet week around here. Not much has been happening in the life of our community. I do see a tent standing out there, but other than that, I see no evidence that anything at all has taken place around here. Uh, I'm just delighted to see all of you here today and on a summer Sunday, no less. So I don't know, why don't we just keep on moving and why don't we sing our second hymn to get you out of here just a little bit earlier. Does that sound okay? No, you're, you're, you're not okay with that. There is something I think you're waiting for. You are waiting for Mr. Bob Davis to share the numbers. Um, in all seriousness, um, Bob, you can come up in just a second. I, I was officiating a wedding in New York yesterday, and when I rolled past the church last night or this morning at about 12.30, I was just at, uh, amazed at how um, the place had been cleaned up. Um, I didn't get to see the sale yesterday, but I was around Friday, and it was really, really good to see all of you pitching in. Um, it is a good thing that each and every one of you did, those of you who helped. After three years, it felt so nice to be able to host such a blockbuster event. Now, I'll say more a little bit later, but Bob has the real report, the real stuff that you've been waiting for, but thank you to all of you for the work that you put into this event. And now, for the suspenseful. <laughs> Okay, well, I'll tell you, it was a great sale. We had great weather, and I thought the crowds were the largest, and uh, I actually filmed them going all the way around. There wasn't any gap at all, just waiting for that church bell at 9 o'clock. Unfortunately, the church bells weren't working, so we had to use a boat horn. <laughs> we had to fire off a boat horn and our, and our cell phone to make sure it was at 9. Um, Channel 8 came, and they were interviewing me and a few other uh, customers. Uh, hopefully they'll put that out on the internet and we can link it out 
the website so you can see it. Um, and, but all of this, and I would say it was one of the best sales ever, in spite of COVID and the talk of recession. Um, thanks to everybody that helped, of course, and especially the department heads that ran their little areas perfectly, and to the executive board that uh, helps make my job easier. On the COVID front, we had no outbreaks at all during intake or sale day, and we passed out 1,500 masks at all the entrances, and nobody seemed to, compare, to complain at that. Um, however, 36 hours before the sale, I get a call from Allison saying her husband will not be able to run the food department. So now I had this headache, 36 hours, because food is so important. Um, so I called the Petersons, who were in retirement, and they came out and with the chapel, and Allison buying the food, everything went off all right. So uh, uh, kudos to those, to those folks there. Um, Henry May asked me to say a few little stories that I pick up along the way, so I'll just take two minutes. Um, lessons learned, location, location, location. Uh, I brought back a whole bunch of um, uh, golf carts from Christ the King. I couldn't sell them in September. They were gone in 15 minutes on Friday. So it depends on time and location. And they were all like $40 each and they just went like that. Um, Luxury had been trying to sell these tattered dolls from the 1900s for three years. Couldn't get a bite on eBay or anything. We moved them to small furniture who can sell anything and they sold them for $200. So uh, it just depends on where you, on where you put the products. Um, the best sales award goes to Carson um, out there in plants. She had two buyers bidding on some vase that nobody wanted apparently, but it was $10 and so rather than having them fight, she held a little impromptu auction and she gave it and she gained $100 out of the sale. So, yes. next year, next year Carson, I'm thinking of selling the red uh, posters. I think we can get $5 a piece for them as a souvenir, so. But that's my idea, not yours. Uh, the funniest incident, again, goes to Carson. Many of you have probably heard it. She was um, unpacking some uh, old plants and pots and stuff, and a mouse ran out. But it ran up her bell-bottom pants. So up the leg it went, and she's trying to apply the tourniquet method to shut it off. Meanwhile, Carlene's over here blocking it in case there was going to have to be more serious <laughs> actions taken. But... The mouse finally turned around and headed for a crack in the foundation, so he's out there waiting for the fair. Um, on the payback front, uh, my typical day sounds like this. Bob, I'm missing shelves and table. Bob, have you seen Mark? Bob, we need more garbage bags. Bob, has anyone seen Mark? Bob, should we accept this item? Bob, I can't find Mark. <laughs> and on Friday, I finally sit down to eat a hot dog and somebody comes over and says, Bob, there's no toilet paper in the porta potties. So finally, I got to say, where is Mark? <laughs> so uh, we'll have to think more about that next year. So um, anyways, here are the figures that um, these are rounded figures. We need the bank to verify them. But based on the envelope counts, it was the second best day we've ever done. We had $91,285 taken in. That was only $400 shot from an all-time gross. So for two-day sales, $91,000. Um, there were four de five departments that actually did the best ever in the last 20 years that I've been counting. Uh, art and frames, flowers, kitchen, knickknacks, and toys all had the best uh, sales they've had in the last 20 years. Um, the top department was the women's, of course. Uh, there were 14264 the artworks was $9,200, really, uh, and luxury was $8,000. Um, the biggest increases, which is really kind of interesting to watch, flowers was up 67% from the prior sale. It's over $3,000, so you sold $3,000 more. Art and frames was up almost $3,000 more, and toys was up 27%. So all in all, it was a great sale. Everybody's uh, department did what they did. They, I think most of our stuff was gone, so we didn't really have a lot to salvage. So appreciate everything. It'll be next week, next year. I'm not sure the exact date because July 4th is on a Tuesday. It gets in the middle of the week. It gets a little touchy. But thanks to everybody. It was a great sale. I look forward to it. And uh, we'll get the numbers out uh, when we get them all finalized.
Bob, a standing ovation. That's a special thing. That's an amazing thing. Um, I do want to thank you publicly for all of the work that you do leading up to the sale uh, and then during the sale as well. It is an amazing accomplishment that you pull off every single year accepting COVID, and it is an invaluable service that you deliver to this community. So thank you. I hope you know how grateful all of us are. Um, I do want to acknowledge uh, the, the White Elephant Sale Board. Uh, I'm not going to go through everybody's name, and then all of our volunteers again. All of you who put your shoulders to the wheel to make it all work. It is amazing that this happens. I really and truly do stand in awe of this place sometimes. And the White Elephant Sale is one of those moments. So Bob and everybody, thank you. Um, two final announcements. Um, our, uh, the partnership store is going to be open following the service, so please know that. And um, Eunice Taylor requests that you return any red white elephant sale aprons that might still be out there to the blue bin outside Mark's office. So if you still have those, um, do that. All right, uh, as to the service this morning, there are some folks I do want to thank. First and foremost, um, I'm grateful to the choir for all of you being here today for the summer sing. That brings an extra bit of life to the service, so it's great to have all of you here today. Uh, our deacons on duty today are Mary Bradford and Ellen Calkins. Our ushers are Ted Crosby and Dave Roberts, and perhaps Mary and Ellen as well. Uh, the Fellowship Hour is being hosted by Julie Martell. Thank you, Julie. And I hope you'll all stay and visit uh, outside on the lawn after the service today. Um, our tech team, I think it's, uh, it, it's Mohammed Solo up there. So Mohammed, thank you for your help up there, and Mark, of course, as well. But uh, finally, once again, to each and every one of you here today, I'll say it um, as simply as I can. You're awesome. Thank you. It's good to be together in this place. Well, let's rise and join to sing hymn number 89, like a mother who has borne us. In our morning offering, we have the opportunity to respond to our blessings with a generosity of heart and spirit. The morning offering will now be received.
Let us pray. Gentle and merciful God, take all that we have given and help us to do all that can be done to heal the world and restore her people. This we pray in the name of thy Son, Jesus the Christ. Amen. You may be seated. Yesterday, as the crowds at the white elephant sale thinned, there were some blessedly almost quiet moments when many of us could look around and think, we did it. We did this difficult and exhausting thing called the white elephant sale once again after a two year hiatus. And just as I was thinking that, a woman came up to me, I didn't know her, and she said, thank you for all you've done here. I've spent more than two years isolated and alone, but here I felt like I came back to a time when people were happy and generous and appreciated being together. I found some great bargains which made me happy, but most of all, I'm happy that I feel like I can breathe again and that the world just might return to being kind. And I thank this church for that. It's a true story. Now I know that there were inevitable tense moments for many of us in these past days, but it's her testimony that I will hang on to. We did it, and we made a good many people grateful. Would you join me in prayer? God of generous love and compassion, we thank you for having brought us safely through a time of trial. We thank you that for the most part we rediscovered that which makes of many one, the joy of fellowship and a shared purpose. We thank you that we found restoration from our fatigue and the laughter and encouragement of others. We thank you that after two years of being forced to stand apart, we once again enjoyed the companionship and fellowship that has helped to keep our community of faith vibrant for generations. Tired though we may be, we have surely won our rest. On this summer morning, we revel in all the blessings of the season, the shade of the tree over the backyard hammock, the cool of early morning, and the dance of a bat on wing at dusk. Nature restores us with her mystery, her resilience, her beauty. Creation is fragile, this we know. Help us, Lord, to honor her by taking from her as little as we possibly can. Help us to protect the integrity of this natural world as best we can for your sake, Creator God, as well as for our own. Keep us humble as we tread upon this earth, we pray. Your broad and diverse world, the world you so loved, is suffering inner injury in so many ways, and for that we grieve. So many of your people are hurting, are hungry, or displaced, or fearful. We pray for all of them now, God of endless mercy. We pray that the hungry might have food. We pray that orphans might know the comfort of love. We pray that those who live in the shadow of violence might know peace. We pray that the leaders of this world might come to honor even the least of your children. For children are, each one of them, precious in your sight and they are the foundation of the future we all share. They are your beloved. We pray that hearts that have grown hardened might be graced with a rekindling of compassion for others. We pray that generosity might flourish and that mercy could somehow be abundant. We pray that this world you so love might heal through an awakening of brotherhood and sisterhood that does truly make of many one. 
In the days to come, grant that we might, each one of us, know the blessings of your spirit within us, that we might be more generous, more merciful, more forgiving toward others. As we seek to understand the world around us, grant us a measure of your vision and your courage and your strength, that we might be peacemakers in a world where violence seems to flourish. In the days to come, we pray that we might be more and more like Jesus the Christ, finding within ourselves the humility and grace the courage and resilience we understand him to have had in abundance. Let it be that because we live in his way, the world might be a better place. All this we pray in his name. Amen. Our scripture readings this morning, you can follow along if you'd like in your bulletin. First from Psalm 90. Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth or ever you had formed the earth and the world from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. Then from the 13th chapter of Luke, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how often have I desired to gather your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings. And then from Matthew chapter 7. Everyone then who hears these words of mine and acts on them will be like a wise man who built his house on rock. The rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house but it did not fall because it had been founded on rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine does not act on them and does not act on them will be like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat against that house and it fell and great was its fall. This ends our readings. I was reminded of a story this week that I'd like to share with you. Nine years ago, our family had just moved into the parsonage when the white elephant sale came around. And I had heard a frightful story about a former associate minister who, for whatever reason, was moving into or out of the parsonage around the time of the sale. And she had all of her stuff hauled over to the church and sold in the sale which in truth, like you, I thought was kind of hilarious when I heard it. And at the time, I remember standing up here in the pulpit and pleading with all of you, don't sell our stuff. We had moved from a house that was pretty tiny in New Haven. We had about four walls and that's all. And we didn't arrive here with all that much. But here's the difference that nine years makes. These days, I'm standing up here pleading with you, take our stuff. <laughs> we leave our door unlocked. Just take it. We'll be happy to see it go. We're good. In all seriousness, I do think that this weekend and this Sunday is one of the more important times in our calendar year. For all of the logistics and the headaches the sale poses, to say nothing of the acquisitive impulses it unleashes in many of us, I'm not exempted. The sale is, I think, a very wonderful thing in the life of this community. 
for those working the sale, it brings all of you together for the sake of a common project, which given the fragmentation and the isolation that we've experienced, I think we all desperately need. For those who came to shop, it provides the thrill of a treasure hunt, for you never know what might turn up. <laughs> but beyond those things, as I walked around on Friday morning, what I felt was the sheer pleasure of the scene. The donuts and the coffee, the hot dogs and the sausages that, believe it or not, some people were consuming for breakfast, <laughs> the baked goods. But more than anything, what I loved seeing and experiencing were people just sitting or standing around and visiting with one another. I think that is the true gift that this church gives to the wider community. And I also think it represents the best of who we are as a community. Creating this space of celebration and pleasure through dedication and support and a tireless work ethic. It is a true gift that all of you give. What I would like to do today is to focus in on that, but really some other ways that the supportive and dedicated nature of this community has been exemplified. And to get at that, I'd like to use some exalted language, words of a poet. They go like this was in another lifetime, one of toil and blood, when blackness was a virtue and the road was full of mud. I came in from the wilderness, a creature void of form. Come in, she said, I'll give you shelter from the storm. These are words from Bob Dylan. Not long ago, I heard a story that captures something of those qualities and something of the nature of this community. It was the year 1968 when it seemed to many people that the world was falling apart around them. And for one family in town, the world did fall apart. Their world crumbled. The father of this large family just picked up and left, leaving behind a wife and a house full of kids ranging in age from high school to elementary school. This truly happened here. And he would never thereafter be a part of their lives. Those left behind in that family to pick up the pieces were devastated. But the loss was compounded by the reactions of many who lived around them. Divorce at that time was regarded as a moral failure. And so many of those who had once been friendly ceased, ceased to return calls, stopped saying hello in the market, and told their children not to mix with that family whose lives had been upended. Even the church that they attended told the mother in no uncertain terms that because of that divorce, she would no longer be welcome in that community. It was 1968, and Reverend Dick Hoag was the minister of this church. And that's when he stepped in. Some of you know, knew Dick Hoag, and he made a brief cameo in my sermon last week when I spoke about the Shakespeare plays that he directed and The Merchant of Venice and Portia's famous speech about the quality of mercy from that play. It turns out that Reverend Hoag knew something about the quality of mercy. He sought that mother out and he spoke to her. And he told her, <clears throat> of course, that she would always be welcome in this place. And of course, her children would always be embraced in this community. Reverend Hoag spoke to her about grace and about mercy. And as I imagine it, he reminded her of the words of the psalmist. 
who said, if God kept track of iniquities, who could stand? No one. But with God, the psalmist says, there is mercy. And within these hallowed walls, under this sacred dome, and surrounded by a community that knows something about grace and mercy, that family found a home, a shelter from the storm of life. Now, I am confident that Reverend Hoag did what he did because he was a kind and decent and thoughtful man. But he was also putting into practice an ancient theology that somehow this congregation knows how to embody. You can find that ancient theology in the words of Jesus where shortly before his own death, he looks upon Jerusalem, that city that was and is the site of so much strife, of so much hardship. He looks upon that city and he's moved to compassion. How often, he says, I have longed to gather you under my wing as a mother hen gathers her young, he says. It's a beautiful image where that wing would shelter and protect those that Jesus loves from the pelting rains of life. It is as though Jesus himself wishes to use his own being, his very body, to shelter those in his care. It is as though with his very body, God in Jesus offers a protective curve, a kind of dome under which people everywhere might gather when the storms of life kick up. I came in from the wilderness, a creature void of form. Come in, Jesus says. I'll give you shelter from the storm. That's what God has promised to do and to be for each and every one of us. Providing and becoming a shelter from the storms of life. And we do, from time to time, face various storms. They come in the form of challenges to our intimate relationships. They come in the form of national and international events in which we happen to be swept up independent of our own intentions. They come in the form of our aging bodies and the fears and anxieties that we sometimes confront in the night. They come in the form of regrets and the pain of loss. It is a human thing to undergo. In Jesus, we glimpse the spiritual presence that relentlessly seeks us out and that does come to find us, especially when we require that particular care when we're exposed to the rains with our unhoused heads. In all generations, God has promised to be our shelter from the storms of life. That's precisely what a church is meant to be as well. We're intended to be a people who demonstrate the curved wing of God's care in our treatment of one another. And I am so proud of this community because that happens around here all the time. Certainly it happens in our big endeavors, like when we provide sanctuary or when we resettle refugees. And certainly, it happens in other big events, like the White Elephant Sale. 
I believe that the real work of the sale isn't actually in the setup or the breakdown or the intake, although that certainly requires real and very difficult work. I happen to believe that the real work is in the interactions that people share with one another while they're doing those other things, pricing and sorting and unloading. The real work is in being together as a community, in talking, in ordinary exchanges where we create small but binding shelters for one another, where we say to one another, how are you doing today? What has it been like for you over the past year or two or three? Let me get that for you. Whether you realize it or not, whether you know it or not, you are creating small but viable temples for one another in which to stand and be for just a moment that stuff matters, maybe more than you know. Because when the big storms actually do roll in, and they do, we come to learn that those small, temporary shelters are actually pieces of a greater whole, parts of the curved wing, the curved dome of God's protective cover. This is a community that understands that deeply. You understand how to provide that. And it makes me proud to minister in this place. Please know that. There is another dimension of this that I wish to explore with you. However true it is that the church is not just a building, but a collection of people who demonstrate God's care in the world. It is also the case that structures like this meeting house are an icon, functioning to show off and to demonstrate that same protective care for anybody who help, happens to walk through these doors. This domed ceiling which creates a near-perfect acoustic environment. And these glassed walls, and this simple design in which we gather to sing and to pray and to think and to mark the passage of time with rituals like baptisms and weddings and funerals and communion. This place has been a shelter for generations. And with our care, it will be that for generations to come. If you think about it, this is the scaffolding or the framework, if you will, that allows us to do the things that we do in the world. We could meet in a school or a rented movie theater, lots of places do but we wouldn't be the same community. This architecture, this hallowed space, is a defining feature of who we are as a people. When a fire broke out on July 3rd, 1907, the meeting house of the First Congregational Church of Old Lyme burned to the ground. Can you imagine that? And then three years later, in 1910, this meeting house that we currently use was dedicated. And for 122 years, people have been sheltering within these walls and under this roof. Imagine this with me. Seven years after the dedication of this meeting house, the United States entered a very scary world war. And no doubt at that time, this was a space of refuge for many 
who found their way here in an uncertain and scary time. When the stock market collapsed a little bit more than a decade later, ushering in the years of the Great Depression, this hallowed roof would have sheltered those seeking relief from that great storm. When the Second World War broke out, we can imagine how our forebears might have come here in order to sense God's protective care amidst the turbulent and scary time. Amidst all of the tumult of Vietnam and than Watergate, we can imagine, and some of you might even remember, how this sacred structure became a house built upon rock. Even while everything else seemed to exist upon sand. Woe to those houses. But thank God for this one. From age to age and from generation to generation, this place has been our dwelling place a shelter from the storms of life. And so it shall continue to be. Throughout that entire time, for 122 years, there has been a slate roof that has quite literally served as the protective shelter on this space allowing people to gather here in safety. And the time has come to replace that roof, to place a new protective shelter over this space. Years of storm and weather have aged the roof and the cracks have been showing for some time now. Last year, when one of the storms we weathered rolled in, the slate gave out and the ceiling sprung a leak, narrowly missing our organ. It might have been a disaster, but thankfully it was not. As in life, so in architecture, there are times in which we need to tend to and care for the protective shelters that have been given to us. That's why the trustees have recently voted to replace the roof on the meeting house, work that's going to begin later in August. Everybody who inspected the roof agreed that it was overdue for a change, overdue for an overhaul, and that the work needed to begin five years ago. Look, I know it is a piece of property maintenance. And yes, it is a piece of historic and architectural preservation. But it is so much more than just that. It is assuring to all of us that throughout whatever storms may yet come for the next 122 years, this space will continue to serve as the curved wing of God's embrace, a shelter in which we can gather to find wisdom and stability and growth for our faith. The cost of such an endeavor is not insignificant. It comes to $200,000. Thanks to an anonymous gift, we're now able to cover half of that cost. But we could use some help to cover the rest. No amount is too large. And no amount is too small. A gift of $10 or $25 will help. But so will gifts of $100 or maybe even $1,000 or maybe even more than that. Look, I know that times are hard. I know that we're entering a recession, perhaps. I know budgets are tight, 
but I submit to you that this is a worthy cause, a worthy project, and a worthy appeal. Because a roof is more than just a roof, at least on this place. It's a symbol and an icon of the protective canopy of God's gracious love for humanity, even through life's most difficult passages. It is literally a shelter from the storms of life. Since Reverend Hoag and his love of Shakespeare have been on my mind lately, I'd like to close with the words from another of Shakespeare's plays, King Lear. When Lear has been unhoused by his daughters, exposed to the literal and the figurative hail of life, the blues falling down all around him, he suddenly becomes aware of others who have also been so exposed. And he offers these immortal words. He says, poor naked wretches, wheresoever you are, that bide the pelting of this pitiless storm, how shall your houseless heads defend you from seasons such as these? Friends, you and I may be bold enough to answer beneath a roof such as this, within walls such as these, and under the domed and winged embrace of a God who has been and who shall be our shelter from the stormy blast and our eternal home. Rather than using the hymn printed in the bulletin, I'd like us to sing together the old words of Isaac Watts from the 18th century. Our God, our help in ages past, our hope for years to come. Let's rise now and sing hymn number 80.
benediction, I just want to say that uh, shortly after the service began, a very special guest wandered in, Mr. Reverend Paul Moraine, who is sitting in the back right now. It's great to have you, Paul. It's great to see you. I understand he's fresh off the plane from South Africa, and I probably shouldn't have even given you away, but um, it does my heart good to see you, and I think it's true for all of us. So it's, uh, it's great to have you, Paul. Friends, hear these words of benediction. Go out into the world in peace. Have courage. Hold on to what is good. Return no one evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted. Support the weak and help the suffering. Honor all people. And love and serve the Lord rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. And may the grace of Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you today and forevermore. Amen. Amen.